Hi, welcome back to part two. This is preventing and reporting sexual harassment and sexual assault. Just a few facts that I like to uh, throw out there for everybody to know. Just kind of bring things into perspective for you. Every 30 minutes, somebody in the United States is either sexually assaulted or sexually harassed. 80% of those people are under the age of 30. 44% of those are under the age of 18. So we're talking about our college age kids. 84% of those are women, 16% are men. So nobody's exempt. It can happen to anybody. Um, you know, I don't care how rough and tough you think you are. I don't care how smart you think you are. There's always somebody out there that's going to outdo you and you're a possible subject or a possible victim of sexual harassment or sexual assault. If you've never been the victim of sexual assault or sexual harassment, you just have no idea what kind of mental trauma those folks go through. You have to experience it before you can even imagine it. So what's CTC's policy? Well, it's pretty simple. Um, you know, zero tolerance, bottom line, when it comes to sexual harassment and sexual assault. Uh, although isolated incidents of offensive conduct of a sexual nature may often not be enough, um, you know, to rise to the level of sexual harassment, because, well, we're going to get to the definition of sexual harassment here in a minute, but just know that a single isolated incident does not make sexual harassment. However, a single isolated incident could be sexual harassment. So CTC does not allow for any potential offensive conduct of a sexual nature. This policy applies equally to offensive conduct um, based on any of the protected categories. So again, we're talking about that unlawful harassment. Okay. So just keep that in mind as we go through as well. So here's our definition of sexual harassment. Sexual harassment is unwelcome sexual advances, requests for sexual favors, and other verbal or physical conduct of a sexual nature. Now the, the part of this that I don't always throw out, but let me just throw it out to you now. If I was to expand that definition, it would be Sexual harassment is a form of sex discrimination that involves unwelcome sexual advances, requests for sexual favors, and other verbal or physical conduct of a sexual nature. So it does fall under one of the protected categories. It's harassment based on sex. So there's two types of sexual harassment. There's the quid pro quo, which means this for that. It's Latin. And then there's the hostile work environment. Quid pro quo is pretty simple. Um, you know, if I'm the boss or I'm the person in control and I say, well, if you want that promotion, you have to sleep with me. Or if you want to get that pay raise, you have to sleep with me. Oh, you want to go to the conference this year? Well, let's go have dinner and, and, and some sex and we'll talk about it. Okay. Um, it's, it's straightforward. This for that. You do something sexually for me and I'll do something that's going to enhance your job, pay your career. Again, we have, to, we have to step back and take a look at that. If the employer, and again, you as the supervisor represent the employer. So if the employer knew or should have known about the conduct and failed to take immediate um, investigative and appropriate remedial action, they could be held liable. The harasser can face um, individual liability, being punitive damage, damages and, and you know, other assorted things, depending on how severe the action was. Um, but the supervisor can also face charges, again, if they knew or should have known. So keep that always in the back of your head so that when you see things happening in your work area, you need to stop it right then and there. Never let it go on. So now we look at the hostile work environment. Hostile work environment, um, this is predominantly repeated unwelcome conduct. Uh, you know, the lesser severe, the, the jokes, the, the eyeballing, the, the minor comments, you know, things of that nature. Uh, but when that behavior 
becomes so severe or pervasive that it alters the terms and conditions of a person's work environment. And the basic term and condition we're talking about is that all employees have a right to work in an environment free from harassment and discrimination based on any of their protected categories. And you as the supervisor are responsible for making sure that they have that environment. We put that responsibility on supervisors because you have the power to administer discipline. And it's the employee, the victim, or the witness who's uncomfortable or feels violated. Uh, they're the ones that determine whether or not the behavior is so severe or pervasive as to alter the work environment. Not you, not EEO, it's the victim or the person, you know, the witness. So how do we know whether any given behavior is unwelcome? And this goes all the way back to um, unlawful harassment. Do you remember the definition of unlawful harassment? Repeated, unwelcome, offensive slurs, jokes, and comments based on any of the protected categories, essentially, is what it was. So how do we know behavior is unwelcome? Easy. The bottom line is this. If a person did not ask for it, then consider that behavior unwelcome. If I don't ask you to tell me a sexual joke, it's unwelcome. If I don't ask you to stare at my body, then don't because it's unwelcome. If I don't ask you to touch me, then don't, because it's unwelcome. It's that simple. And some, some indirect comments that you could keep an ear out for are like these. I don't like it when such and such does this and that or the other thing. Or I sure wish that person would stop doing what is they're doing. Or that's not appropriate for the workplace. I wish somebody would stop that. Sure, that person could go talk to the to the offender and say, hey, I don't appreciate you doing that. Can you please stop it? But they may not feel comfortable with that. So you as a supervisor need to make sure that they're comfortable coming to you and saying, hey, Mr. or Mrs. Supervisor, I don't appreciate what so-and-so was doing. Could you please do something to stop it? Now it's on you, okay? It's on you. Take every allegation seriously. There's no such thing as harmless horseplay when it comes to sexual harassment and sexual assault. Zero tolerance. Remember that? Zero tolerance. So does it have to be some sort of romantic attraction between the two people involved? No, absolutely not. Um, can the harasser be the same sex or gender as the harassee, or the victim? Absolutely. We've had multiple cases um, where both parties involved were female, where both parties involved were male. It does not have to be between a male and a female. And like I said, it, it, the person reporting the bad behavior doesn't even have to be one of the people involved. Anyone who sees it or hears that bad behavior has the right to file a complaint or report that bad behavior if it's disrupting their work environment, right? If it's so severe or pervasive as to disrupt the normal working environment, then they can report that bad behavior. They should report that bad behavior. It's their responsibility. Uh, in Policy 220, it clearly states that if an employee, faculty member, staff, anybody um, believes that a behavior is unwelcome um, and violates the policy, it's their responsibility to report it. Um, I mentioned earlier the severe and pervasive. There have been court cases where they say, you know, Title VII isn't just a general civility code for the American workplace. You can't refer everything to Title VII. That's a violation of Title VII. That's a violation of Title VII. That's a violation of Title VII. That's, it's not set up to be that way. Title VII is our base guideline, okay? Um, you know, it's up to us to make sure that we keep ourselves in check. It's up to us to make sure that our coworkers are operating within the boundaries of the EEO policies. It's up to us as supervisors to make sure that our folks 
are operating within those boundaries. So again, you keep in mind that's severe or pervasive enough. And remember who determines whether or not a behavior is so severe or pervasive that it disrupts the terms and conditions of employment. It's the victim or the witness who reported that bad behavior. It's not your interpretation. It's not your perception of the situation. It's theirs. So again, you know, these these allegations that fly around that people just blow off and ignore. Oh, well, you know, women, they just can't figure out these mechanical things. You got to get a man in there to do it or leave it to a man to screw it up, right? No, those... Those are your known or should have known. Something's going on. Get in there and stop it right away. So what you want to look at is, um, was the conduct unwelcome? Well, that's pretty simple. If somebody reported it or complained about it, then it was obviously unwelcome. To some degree or level, it was unwelcome. It's not up to you to determine whether or not the degree was high enough to be taken action against. No, 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 no. If they report it, you take action. Um, was the behavior based on gender? In other words, would they have done or said the same thing to a person of the opposite sex? Nine times out of ten, the answer is going to be, oh, no, of course not. Why would, you know, if I was a man, why would I make a comment about another guy's body? Um, you know, it's just... It, so that's, that's one of the big questions. And now we get into the questionable part of this. Um, but it shouldn't be questionable. Would a reasonable person of the same gender as the victim, considering all the circumstances, find the conduct sufficiently pervasive or severe enough to alter the terms and conditions of employment? So who's a reasonable person? Well, I would hope you as a supervisor are a reasonable person. If not, we have some very reasonable people up here at HR. You pick up the phone, you call 1391, you talk to Jackie Thomas. She's a very reasonable person. Give her a call. So harassment can come in many different forms. Here's some examples of verbal harassment. Uh, you know, the off-color jokes, the comments about a person's body part or their clothing, um, name-calling, profanity, uh, you know, the unprofessional behavior in verbal style, okay? Then we also have visual harassment. Uh, these are pictures, posters, letters. Um, Things that other people may find offensive. Some physical harassment, and these, these should never happen at work. Now, there are those unusual circumstances where you have a man uh, or a husband and wife working at the same place. We have husbands and wives working here at CTC. You just have to be careful what you do while you're at work. Okay, we don't want any kissing, fondling, grabbing, or caressing. That's that's unwelcome behavior. Even if you're married, you shouldn't be doing that kind of stuff at work. You know, a, a light peck on the cheek as you say goodbye after having a lunch together, that's fine. But not no big, long, dramatic hug and, and tongue down the throat kissing. No. Too much. And we never want unhooking or unzipping or lifting of other person's clothing. We know gifts, sleepwear, perfume, even flowers, not such a good idea. Unwelcome physical conduct. Shouldn't be touching coworkers. Shouldn't be touching in students, especially not students. All right? That could be considered, depending on where you're touching, assault. So don't touch students. Don't touch coworkers. So here's our definition of sexual assault. We gave you the definition of sexual harassment. Here's the definition of sexual assault. Any physical sexual act perpetrated against an individual without consent. Consent is the key here. To include when a person is incapable of giving consent due to alcohol, 
drugs or a disability. So we're talking about forcible rape, unwanted fondling, incest, statutory rape, things of that nature. Policy 221 is our sexual misconduct policy. Uh, and it gives you the definition of consent in that policy. Consent is an affirmative, unambiguous, voluntary, and conscious decision by each involved participant engaging in a specific, agreed-upon sexual activity. Consent can never be implied. You have to be able to, both individuals have to be able to give consent throughout the entire activity. If at any point in time one of the two people can no longer give consent, then the activity needs to stop. So our reporting process is pretty simple. CTC employees and contractors who have reason to know or suspect sexual misconduct has occurred on CTC campus or at a CTC sponsored event are required no notice it doesn't say if they want to it says they're required to promptly report all incidents related to sexual misconduct this is a no kidding stuff here okay if you know something happened then you need to make sure it's reported we do have some folks in place uh, who are willing to take in your allegations of sexual misconduct First, we have Larry Murphy. He's our Director of Risk Management. There's his phone number. Then, of course, we have Campus Police. They're always available, and there's their phone number. Next, we have our Associate Deputy Chancellor of Human Resources. That's Holly Jordan. Her phone number is 1128 from a campus phone. And then finally, well, not finally, but next we have with the Dean of Student Success and Persistence, Julie Starkey. Her number is 1293. And then finally, there's always 911. We also have on, on campus what are known as CSAs, or Campus Security Authorities. Uh, they've been given an additional duty um, to make sure that anything that's reported gets taken care of. So the Campus Security Authorities are available to assist students and employees with making a report to the campus police or other college administrator. They're, they're kind of an in-between between the victim or the witness and the people who are going to take care of the, um, the investigation. Okay? They're, they're here to help you report that incident. So these are, these are some folks who have in place a Title IX coordinator, which, as I mentioned earlier, is um, Dave. Dave Hickman. Uh, our Director of Student Life and Activities, that's Mariselli Vargas, the Dean of Instruction, uh, Jan Anderson, and so on and so forth down the list. Policy 116 talks about consensual relationships. Um, you know, there's nothing that says two employees can't have a healthy relationship. But we don't want those two employees to be in the reporting chain of each other. Right? We don't want one being the boss and the other being the, uh, the, the, uh, the subordinate. Okay? When you have a supervisor subordinate in an intimate relationship, um, the degree of fairness, even perceived fairness, right? It's not always necessarily what's happening here, but it's the perceived fairness, what's going on. So if you're in a situation like that, just let HR know, and they will change the reporting um, so that neither one is the other one's reporting official when it comes to evaluations and such. So your obligation as a supervisor and or manager, review policy 220 with your staff on an annual basis. It even says it in there that you're supposed to re, um, review this subject area annually as part of a continuing education program. 
So reviewing policy 220 is a good way to do that. You need to make sure that all employees under your supervision attend their biennial uh, EEO SHP training. And I gotta, I gotta give you, give you props. Y'all been doing a great job. Uh, our, our numbers have gone way down, way down from when I first started. Even, in, even on a percentage basis, you know, because we had way more employees way back then. But on a percentage basis, we got a very small percentage of folks that are not in compliance, and and we work on that with the supervisors. Um, and it's coming along really well. So I, again, I thank you for all your hard work in helping us get your folks trained. All right, just a, a couple couple cases that we need to review just for uh, emphasis, for wow factor, if you will. The first one is, is Weeks versus Baker McKenzie. Baker McKenzie is one of the largest, if not the largest law firm in the United States, maybe even the world. Um, but Ms. Weeks, within a month of being employed there, reported sexual harassment multiple times. What happened was that the employer, Baker McKenzie, instead of taking action against the person who was sexually harassing Ms. Weeks, they put all the documentation into Ms. Weeks' personnel file instead of the alleged defender. They did nothing to the alleged defender. Well, it got to the point to where, where Ms. Weeks couldn't take it anymore, so she quit, and then she filed a complaint against Baker McKenzie, um, and she won $7.1 million. And that's a lot of mo- that was a lot of money back then. Uh, by today's standards, it's not really a lot. Um, there was a, a case, um, a female, I believe it was a female reporter, sued um, Madison Square Garden in New York and won hundreds of millions of dollars. Um, but at the time, this was a staggering judgment. Um, and along with that $7.1 million, the offender had to pay, it was like $50,000 out of his own pocket. So again, we need to make sure that if someone reports sexual harassment or sexual assault, or if you know or should have known that something's happening, you need to do something to stop it. So we need to prevent retaliation. What is retaliation, you ask? Well, retaliation is unwarranted discipline, ostracism by either coworkers or supervisor, um, involuntary transfers or change of work assignments, even if the new position um, is at the same level can be a problem. Even if you're putting that person into another area of other duties as a sign or even something that falls within the purview of their job. If you're taking him out of taking him or her out of what they normally do, put them in something else could be a problem. Um, again, always make sure your folks are comfortable coming to you because discouraging other people from complaining either by threats or by even by having that closed door policy is not a good thing, okay? Have an open door policy. Let your folks come talk to you if they need to. So this is the retaliation legal standard. This is um, um, Burlington Northern versus White. And this essentially set a new standard for the way they look at retaliation and employers. This was a situation where uh, Miss White was sexually harassed, so they took action against the offender. She continued to work, and then she was retaliated against. She was suspended and suspended and then suspended without pay. And when the employer found out that the supervisor had suspended her, they immediately brought her back to work, gave her back pay, and put her into another position that fell within her job duties. She filed a retaliation complaint and she won. Okay, she was a, she was a, a rail yard worker and she drove, I believe it was a backhoe or a forklift. She was a forklift driver. 
when they brought her back, they put her on the ground doing doing the menial work that, that you know, was well within her job, but not what she was used to. And they put a man in her position in the forklift. Well, she saw that as um, retaliation and sex discrimination. So she filed the complaint and she won. So again, um, don't do anything. Don't take any action without talking to Jackie Thomas first. 1391, Jackie Thomas. Retaliation, don't do it, okay? Uh, don't retaliate against an employee for making a claim or complaining for or for filing a charge of sexual harassment. Like I said earlier, if you didn't do anything wrong, you got nothing to worry about. If you did, then you got to worry. Don't retaliate for or for someone for testifying because um, Title VII protects not just not just the victim, but anyone involved in the complaint process from retaliation. So be careful. Don't, don't retaliate. Don't let your folks retaliate. When is an investigation necessary? An investigation is necessary any time allegations of sexual misconduct happen. Okay, any time allegations of sexual misconduct happen, an investigation is needed. So if somebody comes to you, like I said earlier, files a complaint, or they, they're not really filing a complaint when they come to you, but they're reporting sexual misconduct. After you document the situation, the first thing you do is pick up the phone, 1391, yep, Jackie Thomas. Give her a call, let her know what's happening. Get a statement from the complainant if you can because everything needs to be investigated. So what triggers the obligation? Well, a written complaint, complaint from a witness, supervisory personnel overhears or sees something is happening. Um, even anonymous complaints need to be investigated. One thing that you need to never do is never promise to keep complaints a secret. You're just putting yourself behind the eight ball if you do that. Somebody comes to you and says, look, I don't want this to go any farther than you. I just need to talk to somebody about it. And they tell you what's happening and you don't report it up to Jackie. You don't take any kind of action against that bad behavior. Well, now you're just as guilty as the person doing the bad behavior because you're condoning that bad behavior. Don't put yourself in that situation. EEO is going to follow up on any information that, that could possibly alert CTC to misconduct. Okay? It needs to be up-channeled to HR, to EEO, so that things can be done. Um, even complaints of past harassment must be investigated. You know, that 180-day thing, that's Title VII. We don't want to put CTC in a position to where they could be taken to court. Title VII says you have 180 days from the time an incident occurs to file a complaint. That's almost six months, okay? That's here in Texas. Um, if it's a federal complaint, then you've got 300 days to file. So, you know, past incidents, as long as it's happened within that time frame, report it, report it, report it. Have an open mind and an open door policy. I don't know where, uh, or I don't know how you can have one without the other. If you're going to open your door and let your folks come in and talk to you about things, you have to open your mind at the same time. You don't want to put your preconceived notions, you don't want to throw your spin on whatever it is they're saying. The important part of this is their perception. Their perception is what drives these complaints. And you can't tell them their perception is wrong. So listen for clues that might raise that red flag that says, hey, something's going on. I need to know about this. So you go start asking questions. Uh, encourage reporting of inappropriate conduct. I always, I thoroughly encourage people to report not just offensive conduct, but inappropriate conduct. This is a professional environment. We need to act as such. Complainants may not want to come forward. They might be scared. 
So that's where witnesses, if a witness, if you see something going wrong, if you see something happen that shouldn't be happening, don't wait for the victim to come forward. You come forward and report that bad behavior. Um, so if somebody comes to you with those allegations, say, look, this didn't happen to me, but I saw this or I heard this. You treat that just like you would if the actual victim came to you. Reassure your, your em employees that they can come to you. Right? Make them feel comfortable. Your employees shouldn't be afraid to come and talk to you when bad things happen to them at work. And then always make sure that names and phone numbers for our folks here in HR are available. Jackie Thomas, the EEO coordinator, and Holly Jordan, uh, the associate deputy chancellor of HR. Holly's number is 1128. Jackie's is 1391. Make sure those numbers are available to your people. So knowledge of reporting avenues are critical. People have to know where to go to report this bad behavior. Um, the law requires that we take prompt remedial action uh, against somebody who violates those laws or these policies. The law provides affirmative defense for employers as long as that employer has taken all necessary steps to try and prevent the bad behavior. Okay, so as long as you do your part, you're going to be protected. CTC is going to do their part, so we're protected, but we can't do it without you. I encourage the, the non-supervisory folks to go to their supervisor first, report to bad behavior. And I tell them that you're going to call Jackie Thomas and get things worked out. And I tell them to expect a follow-up from you so that they know that you've done something, taken some sort of action, You've got to give these folks some closure. Don't just leave them hanging out there. We need to take some precautionary measures as supervisors. Um, be objective. Don't promise anything. Be consistent in your disciplinary measures. If you, if you smack this guy for doing this, then you smack that guy for doing that. If you kick this guy for doing that, then you kick this guy for doing that. Same thing across the board. You don't just say, don't do that to one person, and the other person, you write them up this big, long, you know, disciplinary form and submit it to Jackie Thomas and all this other stuff. You have to be consistent. Um, document discussions thoroughly. Somebody comes to you with allegations, document, document, document. It's the same thing I tell non-supervisory folks. Document, document, document. Who, what, when, where, why, and how it made you feel. And then take that document to your supervisor. Let the supervisor know. The supervisor has the power to administer discipline. So the supervisor should do something about it. Call Jackie Thomas. Jackie Thomas might take over, take care of everything for you. But you have to do your part. So once the investigation is complete, HR is going to do their job. They're going to make sure that the facts and evidence um, support whatever their findings are. Uh, they're going to determine if the complaint has been substantiated or not. They'll look at implementing effective remediation. Okay, they're going to make sure that whatever action is taken against that person it is appropriate. It's going to fit based on what they did compared to other incidents that have happened in the past. They'll determine whether or not disciplinary action uh, is warranted. They'll meet with the complainant and the accused separately, and they're going to let them know that they're uh, the complainant. They'll let them know that their allegations were investigated and appropriate action was taken. They're not going to give them all the gory details because the victim doesn't need to know all the gory details, but they do need closure. And then they're going to follow up with the complainant uh, after a free few weeks to go by to make sure that everything is okay, make sure that the behavior hasn't continued again or, or started up again. They're going to make sure that they're not being ret retaliated against. Because really, in, in the 
big picture of things, um, the potential damages for CTC and the offender could be significant in a harassment or retaliation complaint. Um, you know, there are things like uh, compensatory damages, money, uh, back wages for lost time, attorney's fees and court costs, all this CTC would have to pay for. They would have to look at possible restoration of jobs if there were any missed promotions. Well, we don't have that problem here because we don't promote. They need, they'll, they'll look at, I mean, the possibility of emotional distress is there. That's always a big ticket item when you go to court if you're emotionally distressed. Usually you can count on getting some money out of that. So we want to prevent that kind of stuff from happening. So we address the allegations the first time they come up, and we take immediate and appropriate action. So here again are our points of contact. Holly Jordan, the Associate Deputy Chancellor of HR, Jackie Thomas, the EEO Coordinator. For faculty, contact your respective deans, Jan Anderson on Central Campus, Jackie Hare on Fort Hood or Continental Campus, Gary Kindred over in Europe. And then if it's an issue between students, contact Maricelli Vargas, our Director of Student Life. And that takes care of your supervisor, Equal Employment Opportunity Sexual Harassment Prevention Training. You're good to go for two more years. Um, Make sure you watch out for the second portion of the training completion form pass key coming up here after the credits, and we'll see you again. Take care. Stay safe.